That's what happened uh, not long ago in Yellowstone at the Biscuit Basin site, a site that there was tourists at. And, you know, my wife and I actually were there a couple of years ago visiting. And there was a huge explosion. We're going to take a look at that. And luckily, thankfully, no one was seriously hurt because uh, rocks weighing tens to hundreds of pounds were thrown way up in the air. And if a 50-pound rock goes 100 feet in the air and then drops down on you, that's going to kill you. So thankfully, there were no serious injuries. But what about this Yellowstone explosion and gold? Are you interested in finding out how this might be something that's important to gold deposits? Well, the truth is, it's critically important to a lot of different kinds of gold deposits. These kinds of explosions make way for hot circulating mineralized waters that can contain gold and silver and other metals as well. And you will be surprised at how many different kinds of deposits are dependent on explosions a lot like this, some more violent, some less violent, but even so, one way or the other, a lot of times rock has to go boom before the gold deposits can form. And why is that? We're going to talk about it. It's because hot water circulates, hot water that's mineralized with gold in it, circulates to make gold deposits. And the broken rock that's left behind from these explosions is a lot of what paves the way for that mineralized oh, hot liquid, hot sulfury liquid with gold and silver and maybe other minerals as well to deposit and make veins or breccia deposits. We're going to dig into this and get in all the details. But first, let's take a look at that explosion again. It was pretty amazing. You can see from this photo that it just shot hundreds of feet in the air, all kinds of rocks and debris. I can't blame the guy who's driving this car away for uh, driving away as fast as he could step on the gas and get out of there. And yet this happened when there were tourists looking on and standing there looking at the pools and they never expected something like this to happen so suddenly and without any warning at all. It's hard to believe, but people were standing on these board rocks when the thing exploded. You can see all the rock and debris. It, the boardwalks were shredded. It's amazing that none of the people were shredded. It's really powerful. And the, the pools afterwards, you know, they're back to at least close to normal, but there's a big debris field and there'll be a lot of repair that needs to be done before tourists can re-enter the area. A lot of testing and, and analyzing to make sure that there's no more hazards that are waiting to explode in the near future. And although they can be pretty destructive, um, small, and, and this would be considered not large but small-ish uh, hydrothermal explosions are comparatively common. They actually had another one a little smaller than this in the backcountry of Yellowstone uh, in April. So, you know, they happen from time to time. And as this little graph shows, they happen several to many per century. Strong earthquakes, one to several per century. Lava flows, it's about 100 per million years. So that's like once every 10,000 years of a lava flow. But the big caldera forming eruptions, only one or two per million years. But still, over geologic time, you get the accumulation of this breakage of rock, whether it's from a hydrothermal explosion or from a strong earthquake, opening up the rock to allow the mineralized fluids to flow. Way back in 1888, um, almost 140 years ago, they had a similar explosion at Excelsior Geyser, and it looked like this. Now, there were people there to see it, but of course there were no pictures or anything, but this is an artist's rendering based on the folks who were there to kind of explain what it looked like. And they did a pretty good job, I think, because this looks very much like the one that happened in Biscuit Basins just a little while ago. Now, everyone knows that there's all kinds of geysers and hot springs and, you know, hot water circulation areas in Yellowstone National Park. I mean, that's what it's famous for. I mean, there, and some of them, you know, like this are apparently highly mineralized with iron and, and that sort of thing. And some of these colors are actually from 
hot water loving bacteria that uh, are closely associated with these hot springs. And like I say, it's what it's famous for, but it's not so much famous for explosions like the one we just had. Now, the one that we just saw that was uh, recently in Biscuit Basin was at a hot water lake like this. And it wasn't this one, but it was a different one, but similar. And water feeds up into these lakes from down below. Uh, the hot water comes up and the, the lake overflows and the water flows out of it. But the, at this other one, the water coming up became trapped. It became blocked. Uh, something happened and its way upward was blocked. And pressure built up and built up and built up and built up to the point where the rock that was holding it down and holding it confined gave way because the pressure was too much. And then as soon as the pressure was relieved, the water that had been under pressure and superheated and super pressurized, the pressure was released and it all instantly turned to steam. It's, it's a, just a property. You can keep hot water as water under pressure, but once you relieve the pressure, it all flashes to steam. And that's what caused the huge explosion was the sudden conversion of that water into steam. So we talked about Yellowstone and, and how the hot springs are everywhere there and, and how famous it is and explosions that they have there from time to time. It's not that unusual. But let's talk about how mineral deposits, how gold and silver deposits are formed out of hot springs because hot springs are an important class of uh, gold and silver deposits. Let's talk about the, the details and the geology and, and where in the hot spring system you're likely to find the gold. And the easy answer is it's not on the surface. You know, you're not going to walk around at Yellowstone and pick up gold nuggets off the surface of the ground. But let's talk about where the gold is and how it gets mined and the details of that. So let's dive in with that. While Yellowstone may be the most famous of geothermal hot springs and and geysers and and the like there are lots of them all over the u.s and elsewhere in the world all over the planet uh, this is a smaller one uh, near bishop california in eastern california and it's probably had its explosions over you know geologic time and there are mineral deposits in this general area, you know, not right at the surface at uh, this hot springs, but in the general area where there's been similar activity over many thousands of years. In fact, in Reno, there's a huge area known as Steamboat Springs, south of town. This is actually a very old picture um, showing huge amounts of steam. It does not emit nearly this much steam anymore. But even in the 1980s, when I first moved to this area, uh, there was a lot more steam. It just shows that these fumaroles and geysers and stuff ebb and flow with the weather and with the water table. Uh, Steamboat Hot Springs used to have the third highest geyser in the United States. It would shoot up in the air a huge distance, third highest, but that geyser is long gone. And part of the reason is that they built a geothermal power plant here. In fact, a series of them that generate quite a bit of electricity from the hot water in the ground. Now, I've had some involvement with these plants, and I happen to know that in parts of these plants where the water cools off, they actually get depositions of a mineral called stibnite. It's antimony sulfide, a mineral associated with gold and silver deposits. In fact, a number of geologists have said that the Steamboat Hot Springs area is probably a lot like what the Comstock Lode looked like uh, several million years ago. And the Comstock Lode is really only about 15 miles away as the crow flies. There's actually a geothermal plant somewhere, and I've seen pictures of it, but I couldn't find copies on the internet to show you guys where in the parts of the plant where it cools off there's actually gold that gets deposited. And like I say, I've seen pictures of it where the inside of the thing gets a deposition of metallic gold instead of stibnite that occurs at this plant. This little diagram kind of tells the story. Um, you have at the bottom, the lowest level, uh, intrusive rocks and molten rock that's coming up from down below in the earth. 
And the heat from that makes things rise. And you've got rain from the surface coming down and getting into the rocks and getting into the water table. But the heat from the molten rock below makes the heats the water up and makes it rise. And at the same time, it kind of dissolves out traces of gold and traces of silver, traces of other elements that are in the rock and brings them up toward the surface. But the problem is gold and silver, they come out a little bit more easily. They, they, they come out more quickly. And so the green areas that I should have says ore body on the diagram, this is going to be where you're gold and silver are deposited. It's going to be anywhere from a hundred to maybe even up to a thousand feet down from the surface. And on the surface, you're going to have silica center. That's the white rock that you see in Yellowstone and at uh, steamboat and other places where you have hot springs and you see surface geysers, fumaroles, hot springs, and the like, that's the surface expression. And the, the last stuff to come out right close to the surface uh, the last metals anyway, include mercury and antimony. And so uh, the power plant that uh, is there at Steamboat gets its water from down below, but it's not hot enough to be bringing up gold bearing water. It's hot enough to be bringing up antimony bearing water. And actually in the Steamboat area, they have mined some mercury too in the past, in decades past. So uh, the gold and silver though are going to be down a ways. And when you have the deposits that you have on the surface, the surface geysers and fumaroles, the silica center on the surface, that's usually eroded away so that you see then the veins that have the ore bodies in them. Now, talking about this circulating water and how it forms mineral deposits brings us back to these explosions because basically solid rock, you don't circulate water through it easily. You either need something like a serious fault zone that opens up a break in the rock or even better, an explosion that turns an area of rock into a loose breccia that then allows the water to circulate through it. And this is kind of just the design of it. You have a pressurized water chamber at the bottom, a, a chamber that eventually becomes overpressurized and, and the pressure is so great that it basically blows out the rock above it. And open fault zones allow water to circulate and form veins, but uh, veins and breccia pipes can be related. You can get an area lower down that's like this vein that becomes overpressurized and eventually becomes the explosion that causes the breccia pipe or cone above it. And basically one, two, and three are the areas likely to be mineralized. And with one most likely, two less likely, and three the least likely. And then four is the material on the surface that was basically thrown out during the explosion. Breccia fragments can be all grades of mineralization from uh, lots of low grade to super high grade like this. Each of these areas that have gold around it are basically the fragments of rock that were created in a breccia. And then the gold is deposited around the edges of these fragments of rock. And then the lighter colored in the middle, it was an open space and it's basically filled with quartz. But you can see this rock is amazingly rich. This is from Goldfield in central Nevada. Here's another fabulously rich piece of breccia ore, this time from the Sleeper Mine in northern Nevada. Again, you can see the broken fragments of rock and how the gold has formed around it. Uh, Sleeper produced some amazingly rich ore and was a hot springs type of deposit. Now, not all breccia ore uh, that forms from these types of things is super rich and filled, filled with visible gold. Uh, you know, this is ore from a mine in Romania and you can see the chunks of rock and then it's surrounded by little veins and veinlets of quartz that have gone in and mineralized uh, in the open space that was left behind when the breccia uh, was formed. 
Here's another example of something that's just a, a good milling grade ore, but it's a lot different than what we just looked at that's mostly rock with a little bit of quartz surrounding the space. This piece is the other way around. It's mostly quartz with uh, some amount of rock left over from the breccia, but the quartz really moved in and, and took over the open space. So while vein type deposits uh, may be better known and more commonly recognized by prospectors, it's worthwhile to keep your eyes open for these breccia ores because as I've just shown you, some of them can be extremely rich. So now that you've learned a little bit more about these unusual types of ores, uh, maybe the next time you see an explosion at Yellowstone or someplace else, you'll just think, well, the ground's getting ready to prepare a new gold deposit down below, maybe a hundred feet, maybe a few hundred feet, but not on the surface. Now you'll never be able to prospect at Yellowstone and you're not likely to find a gold and silver at an active geothermal system where you've got steam and hot water, but there's a lot of districts where uh, there may have been hot springs in the past that have nice gold and silver now. But whatever you do as far as your prospecting, prospecting is a skill and you have to know what you're doing to be successful. And in order to impart to you that skill so that you can pick up a lot faster than I did uh, by having direct information given to you, I wrote a book. It's called Fistful of Gold and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about my book right now. This is my book is full of gold. It's an encyclopedia of everything you need to know to go out and find gold for yourself. It distills down my 45 years of experience out in the field prospecting as well as my degree in mine engineering. It's like I say, an encyclopedia, there's a lot to it. It's over 250,000 words long, uh, hundreds of pages with hundreds of illustrations uh, teaching you what you need to know about geology, about mining districts, about techniques of finding gold. It covers metal detectors, uh, sluicing, panning, dry washing, high bankers, you know, you name it, it's covered in there. It talks of some about platinum and diamonds, but it's mostly about gold because gold is more widespread. It uh, is not so much a book about where to find gold, but a book about how to find gold. Because even if you have a location where gold was mined in the past and you go out there, well, where should you look to be successful in your prospecting, to find the gold that's there? This is the book that's gonna tell you that information. I spent most of 10 years writing this book, so I, I thought a long time about it. It's got, uh, like I say, lots of information and lots of illustrations, and I've had results from people who bought it. Um, it's available on Amazon, but I recommend buying it through High Plains Prospectors, and I'll put a link in the description for buying this book through them. They have a better price than Amazon, and I have a special deal that I'll tell you a little bit more about where I can get a, you can get a 5% discount uh, from the price even with that. On Amazon, the book rates a 4.7 out of five, which means that of all the people that have bought it, they've been really highly satisfied. And I think you, if you buy my book, will be just as highly satisfied as well. Now let's talk a little bit more about High Plains Prospectors. They're a prospecting shop, a mail order prospecting shop that I've partnered with. Uh, that uh, The deal is that I can get you a 5% discount uh, a coupon code and I'm going to put the code to that right here. It's just Chris Ralph, all caps with no space between Chris and Ralph. Uh, you put that in there as a discount code and you'll get 5% off their already really good prices. I think it's a great deal where you win by getting a discount. I get a little percentage of that and they get new business. So if you need prospecting supplies, High Plains is really the way to go. And I'll put information, like I say, in the description more about how you can work with them. Because I'm working with them, uh, they really are great guys, a great company. For even more information, I also have a website and I'm going to show you my webpage and talk a little bit more about that right now. 
This is my webpage. It's located at nevadaoutbackgems.com. You can Google it or I have a link down in the description below. But there's lots of information here, miscellaneous stuff, pictures, some historic information as well, stories. Um, it's got a lot of great fun stuff. Uh, you'll probably be interested in it. Now on all of my YouTube videos, I encourage you guys to ask questions. If you have thoughts, comments, um, you know, suggestions for things that I ought to look at in my videos, uh, things that uh, you want to find out more about, and I answer 100% of my questions. There's not very many uh, YouTubers out there that answer 100% of their questions. I'm one of the few. And so I will do my best to answer what you have. I mean, uh, I only can write so much. Um, sometimes the answer is something where I'm gonna recommend that you buy the book and read about it. I also ask that you subscribe to my channel, uh, click the bell notification so that every time I come out with a new video, uh, you'll be able to watch it. And like I say, I cover a huge amount of topics. I also have 250 videos that I've already done. And so you can go back through my catalog of videos on YouTube. I'm sure there'll be many videos there that you'll want to take a look at, especially if you have any interest in gold or platinum, diamonds, gemstones, geology, and that sort of stuff. My YouTube site is gonna be right up your alley. So I'll see you again real soon. Uh, we'll be out in the field and, and back in the office uh, at the whiteboard, and whether we're looking at gold or platinum, diamonds, gemstones, or other interesting geology, it's gonna be fun, you're gonna enjoy it, and we'll see you again real soon.